it was like living on a ranch or a farm. Uh, very, very fortunate that the depression created a, a, a no growth situation here in which there was uh, no uh, lots being sold or anything. So we grew up uh, with all this wide open space. The neighborhood of 88-year-old Marshall E. Stewart's youth is very different from the one he lives in today. Yet he still lives just next door to the home he grew up in. Stewart is one of the first residents of the South Torrens neighborhood known as the Hollywood Riviera, a neighborhood Stewart's uncle, Clifford F. Reed, named and also developed. He and my aunt had gone on the honeymoon, they'd gone to Europe and, and to the French Riviera. He much admired the French Riviera with the, the water and the, and the setting and the, the, the tile roofs. Uh, they figured this would have a similar uh, uh, setting with the curve of the, of the bay and, and the slope of the ground and everything. It had a lot of similarities to what they saw over in the French Riviera. Reed was a successful real estate developer who moved to Southern California from McMinnville, Oregon in the early 1920s. During a visit to the coast, he became captivated by this gem of undeveloped land just below the Palos Verdes Peninsula. In 1927, he decided to approach the land's owner, railroad magnate Henry E. Huntington, with an idea. He proposed an exclusive upscale housing development for one square mile of the area to be called the Hollywood Riviera. Huntington agreed to the idea, and construction began under the Clifford F. Reed Corporation. Voters annexed the area into Torrance city limits that same year. Late 20s and early 30s, Hollywood was the, the big area, the big thing. The studios were doing a lot of uh, big uh, productions. And so uh, by combining the, the two names, Hollywood and Riviera, why he thought it would be an attractive uh, place for them to come and uh, live and uh, commute to their jobs in Hollywood. A few stars, such as Rosemary de Camp, began to settle in the area. The homes would be Mediterranean style, white stucco with red tile roofs, just as Reed had seen in the French Riviera. Between 1927 and 1929, about 16 homes were built just east of PCH and south of what is now PV Boulevard, an ambitious pace for the era. Grading the streets were done strictly with mules. They didn't have the machinery. They didn't have the tractors that were uh, uh, available and the mules were a great source of energy and, uh, and were very reliable. The crown jewel of the development was to be the Hollywood Riviera Beach Club, built where Miramar Park is today. We're just about standing in what was a swimming pool at one time, and this was the Hollywood Riviera Beach Club, and it was built in the, in the 1929 uh, and 28, and it was going to be a place for anybody that lived in Hollywood Riviera uh, that, that this was access to the club. It was their clubhouse. It was quite active and of course it had a uh, pool and a nice recreational facility with a whole beach there and uh, a nice sitting place inside the court. And uh, it had rooms for people if they wanted to come and rent. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a marvelous asset to the community. Reed continued to develop the Oasis by the Sea, seeking to gain the interest of new prospective buyers. His sales presentation included this silent film. But as with other real estate developments at the time, not everyone was welcome to the new neighborhood. Palos Verdes and Hollywood Riviera both uh, were uh, limited to color, so uh, that was uh, not uncommon back in those days in certain areas. People did come here and were interested in buying property here and uh, they could come and use the club and come to parties and, uh, and come to eat there, but they could not buy property here if they were uh, uh, Jewish people and, uh, and also uh, the color factor. So that was uh, uh, a, did, it, did, it was a deterrent for uh, quite a few of the Hollywood people. 
Perhaps the most prominent remnant of Reed's Hollywood Riviera vision is Reed's own home located here on Monte de Oro, looking very much as it did when it was built back in 1928. We've read up on what the house is all about and what it, what it has in it, and so we try to share that with others. Welcome. Hi. Come in. We're happy to have you this afternoon. Current owners Elsina and Robert Rice dedicate themselves to preserving Reed's home and educating new generations on its local historic significance. I think there's one thing that, that's really important and that is how beautifully the Reed's built with such detail. The house is Italian and they've done a lot of painting in the ceilings and uh, the beautiful tile work on the floors were imported, the tile was imported from Italy, and it's just, it's just magnificent. Every detail is, is more perfect than the next. The turret is very, I think, dramatic, uh, with its slit windows and leaded glass. In the afternoon, the sun picks that up and it just sparkles. We've enjoyed that very, very much through the years. And the, the walls, you'll notice, look like cut stone when in fact they're, they're a faux stone made out of a plaster that's been scored. It was very popular during that time. So I understand that a lot of the furniture also is, is original to the home? Yes. Uh, actually the rug on the floor was delivered with a crane through the front door and it has not been off this floor since it was delivered in 1928. And in addition to that, the piano is a parlor grand piano which is smaller than a baby grand, but certainly large enough for this room. And it is original, again, with the house, as is the sofa and actually all the gold chairs in this room. And in the home's finer details, evidence of its California roots. Remember in 1928 that California was encouraging people to come and, and settle in the new state. One of the main things they talked about was oranges and we had lots of orange groves and they've picked up that same theme with the oranges on the door and also the oranges on the ceiling, the same kind of hand-painted Michelangelo style. In the center there, they have a whole grouping of oranges. Oranges, a fitting symbol of the California dream, a dream that wasn't fully realized in the Hollywood Riviera of today, a thriving community, yet not exactly what Reed envisioned. What happened to the dream? As Stewart recalls, it began to fade with the Great Depression and the start of World War II. Stewart and his brothers enlisted in the military, but they didn't have to leave home to experience the war firsthand. Right from the clubhouse here, right in front, on Christmas Day, I came home and I was home for that day, and right out there, a uh, submarine came up, uh, a Japanese submarine came up alongside a, a, a barge the fishing barge that sat out there. And uh, they, they brought a bunch of soldiers here to guard the coast. Well, they reported it and a small plane came over and, and dropped a depth charge or dropped a bomb. And it, it, instead of hitting the sub, it landed between the sub and the barge and the sub, sub went on out. They could see uh, that a Navy ship had come around and was firing out there and uh, it's probably a destroyer. And uh, so uh, that was our big excitement here. The war put further development to a halt and also took its toll on the beach club. They uh, abused it because of the uh, any aircraft guns that they placed on the uh, bluff, bluff south of the club. And, and they were firing guns there, so the, the, the club suffered tremendously from that, the concussion. Uh, uh, just really uh, d caused things to uh, degrade quite rapidly. After World War II, why they tried to restore it, a man did try to do it, and then he uh, ran out of money, and some other people came in and took over and uh, promoted it and sold a bunch of uh, memberships for the summer, and uh, like they were going to keep it going on, and they bailed out, and uh, then it sort of became a dive. and. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it lost its uh, integrity. Its integrity gone, and the rest of it to follow shortly after. Somebody was careless and set it on fire. 
and uh, it was a it was a, just a shame, and because uh, it could have been brought back uh, within t within time. After World War II, development resumed, but Reed, now older, no longer had the energy or the resources to bring his New World Riviera vision of white stucco mansions and tile roofs to full fruition. The expansion uh, was very rapid uh, from then all through the, uh, after, and the, and the late 40s and, and 50s. A lot of uh, houses were built and uh, lots were sold and it became a, a very viable community. The uh, Homes Association had, uh, that was originally uh, in charge of uh, maintaining the tile roofs was not in business anymore, and there was no one to uh, enforce the, the restrictions. And there was some tile roofs built, but uh, became a, uh, a mixed uh, residence. A residence where Stewart would marry and happily raise his three children. Although the Hollywood Riviera didn't become the community his uncle envisioned, Stewart and other homeowners like the Rices are no less happy with the neighborhood they call home. It's been a great satisfaction uh, to see the development of it uh, from what it was originally. I think I live in paradise. I couldn't be happier. There's no place that I'd rather be than right here. And Stewart believes his uncle would share their sentiment. He would be chagrined to the point where it didn't develop an old tile roof houses as he originally envisioned. I think he'd be pleased to see it developed. His development has worked. Colleen Farrell with the Centennial Oral History.